Hello, I'm Professor Marcus de Sotoy, and this is a brief history of mathematics, which was first broadcast on BBC Radio 4. All ten episodes of the series are now available at bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts for you to collect and keep and listen to whenever you wish. This podcast of the last episode is set in 20th century France. It's the story of a highly productive but elusive mathematical hero. I remember as a graduate student being quite terrified by the collected works of Nicolas Bourbaki. His work filled several shelves of the Whitehead Library in Oxford. Was this the kind of productivity that would be expected of me? It was several years before I learnt more about this prolific and elusive mathematician, and I started to feel a little less insecure. The collected works of Bourbaki represent one of the most ambitious enterprises in mathematical history, an attempt to reform and reinvigorate the whole discipline, to build a new way of thinking about mathematics that would unify two previously distinct areas of the subject, shapes and numbers. Already, this new way of mathematical thinking has paved the way for the solution to the notoriously difficult Fermat's Last Theorem, proved by the British mathematician Andrew Wiles in 1995. And I use it every day to navigate the complex modern world of mathematics. And I believe Borbaki's mathematics will lead to many remarkable mathematical and scientific breakthroughs in the decades to come. A Brief History of Mathematics with Marcus de Sotoy. Throughout the 19th century, the Paris Academy of Science was no longer the mathematical powerhouse it had once been. It was overshadowed by Göttingen and the giants of German mathematics, Carl Friedrich Gauss and Bernhard Riemann. World War I killed off most of the remaining mathematical talent, and at the beginning of the 20th century, the next generation of French mathematicians found themselves without a father figure to inspire and guide them. Until one such mathematician, André Vey, wrote to a member of the Academy of Science to introduce a new colleague. I'm sure you'll recall that Monsieur Bourbaki is the former professor of the Royal University of besse en paul de Vie, whom I met some time ago at a café, where he spends most of the day and even the night, having lost both his job and most of his fortune amid the troubles that caused the unfortunate Paul de Vere nation to disappear from Europe. Now he earns his living at the café by giving lessons in Belot, the card game he plays so brilliantly. Bourbaki submitted countless papers to the Academy of Science in Paris, together with the expected biographical details. World War I interrupted Bourbaki's fruitful scientific work. He then found himself in the Caucasus during the Revolution of 1917, working in a research institute in Poldavia. Civil war forced Bourbaki to emigrate to Iran in 1920. This was the beginning of a dark period in Bourbaki's life. He finally ended up in Paris, where no mathematician would acknowledge the originality of his ideas. It was all fiction. Monsieur Bourbaki was a figment of André Vey's imagination the pseudonym for a group of young French mathematicians. A character created to reinvigorate French mathematics, blow away old assumptions and create a bold new mathematics for the future. Nicolas Bourbaki, the mathematician that never was. Hence all those many shelves in the Whitehead Library. They and his contemporaries would meet three times a year for a week or two at a time to brainstorm about mathematics normally at a café on the left bank, no doubt the scene of Bourbaki's card-playing. But sometimes they would retreat to the countryside so as not to be distracted from their goal, to rewrite mathematics from the bottom upwards and put the whole subject on firm, rigorous foundations. Rigour is to the mathematician what mortality is to men. Bourbaki was rigorous, but anarchic. Indeed, the only thing that wasn't allowed in meetings was to remain silent. Bourbaki was about creating a new mathematics, one that everyone was expected to take part in moulding. Certain foreigners, invited as spectators to Bourbaki meetings, always come out with the impression that it is a gathering of madmen. They could not imagine how these people, shouting sometimes three or four at the same time, could ever come up with something intelligent. But for the members of the Bourbaki collective, 
It was all part of the process. The guiding ethos of this group was based on the very thing that makes mathematics so unique amongst the sciences. In physics, chemistry or biology, theories live or die based on their ability to account for experimental data. Mathematics is different. Once a theorem is proved, it will hold true forever. Each generation of mathematicians builds on the work of its predecessors. But Bourbaki felt that the mathematical edifice had become rather rambling and with too many disconnected wings. They believed in the inherent unity of mathematics. They wanted to present the whole of mathematics in its purest, simplest form, to reclassify and reform the entire discipline. They wanted to strip mathematics back to its deepest foundations. The maths they did was highly abstract and very ambitious. The invention of Bourbaki did reinvigorate French mathematics, just as they had hoped. But then the spectre of another war began to loom over Europe. They fled to Finland, hoping to keep Bourbaki alive from there, but soon ended up in prison on suspicion of being a Soviet spy. His calling cards, belonging to Nicolas Bourbaki, and pages of incomprehensible equations all looked very suspicious to the Finnish authorities. He narrowly avoided execution, but escaped one prison in Finland only to be thrown into another in Rouen in France, where he was charged with desertion from the army. Mathematics had always been a comfort to Vey when the going got tough in the real world. Once when I took a painful fall, my sister Simone could think of nothing for it but to run and fetch my algebra book to comfort me. And as Vey waited trial in prison... It was mathematics again that brought him comfort. One of the joys of mathematics is that it requires little equipment beyond pen, paper and imagination. The prison provided the first two of these, and they had plenty of the third. In April 1940, he wrote to his wife, Eveline, My mathematics work is proceeding beyond my wildest hopes, and I'm even a bit worried. If it is only in prison that I work so well... Will I have to arrange to spend two or three months locked up a year? Usually, Vey was very cautious about publishing his work too soon, preferring to check every detail of his proof. But on this occasion, he felt that the future was too uncertain to risk delay. He wrote to the editor of the prestigious French journal Contre Rendu. I'm very pleased with it, especially because of where it was written. It must be the very first in the history of mathematics. And because it is a fine way of letting all my friends around the world know that I exist and I am thrilled by the beauty of my theorems. To which the editor's son, a friend and colleague of Vey's, wrote back enviously, We're not all lucky enough to sit and work undisturbed like you. In prison in Rouen, Vey began to develop a whole new approach to mathematics, building on the work of Bourbaki, an approach that would allow him to change the algebra of equations into something much more tangible. In the beginning of the 17th century, the French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes invented a way to convert lines, shapes and places into numbers and equations. Any position in space, he realised, could be described as a set of coordinates. I'm standing outside Broadcasting House in central London and I've got a global positioning system here on my phone. Now, the phone is telling me that my latitude is 51.5 degrees north and my longitude is 0.14 degrees west. Now, these numbers identify my north, south and east, west location as measured from the place where the equator meets the line of longitude running north, south through Greenwich, the so-called meridian line. And they allow you to locate my precise geometric location on the Earth's surface. In school today, most children learn about two distinct areas of maths, shapes and numbers. But Descartes showed us how to turn shapes into numbers using his idea of coordinates. André Vey wondered if you could do a similar thing, but in the opposite direction. Could you use intuitive ideas about geometry and shapes to solve problems in the world of numbers and equations? He showed us how to think about equations as shapes. Yes, it's a tricky idea. And it was complicated even for the mathematicians of the time. It's a giant mathematical leap forward. 
absolutely the product of Bourbaki's extreme ambition, and it moved the entire discipline of mathematics onto a totally new level. They created the mathematically beautiful concept of what is now called algebraic geometry. This concept has since enabled mathematicians to solve equations that for centuries had seemed quite impossible. Most famously, it paved the way for a solution in 1995 of Fermat's last theorem. The British mathematician Andrew Wiles may have played the final chord in this much celebrated proof, but it was the whole idea of algebraic geometry that made this possible. Now, as you may have heard me argue more than once in this brief history of mathematics, I believe mathematics is the driving force behind modern science. So I can anticipate your next question. What has this highly abstract concept of algebraic geometry done for the real world of science and technology? And I'm going to say that it's too early to judge. Mathematics is often ahead of the game. It can take two or three hundred years for the full power of mathematical insights to be appreciated by scientists. But already there are promising signs that algebraic geometry will prove itself in the real world of science and technology. It's used in codes on mobile phones and smart cards. Some biologists believe it sheds light on the evolution of genes. And robot designers are interested in it too. They himself, however was never that bothered by how his mathematics would be applied. They was released from prison in May 1940, and rather than sticking around in France, he did what many European mathematicians were doing at the time, move to America. The Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton had opened its doors in 1933, by the end of the war was a well-funded research centre with many superstars in the faculty, Einstein and Gödel and countless other scientific émigrés. With Europe ravished by war and Göttingen destroyed by Hitler, Princeton quickly became the place to study mathematics. And to this day, it continues to attract mathematical talent from across Europe, including Britain's very own mathematical superstar, Andrew Wiles. Although this autumn... Andrew Wiles is due to arrive in Oxford, where I work. Could this be a good omen for where might be the happening place for mathematics in the 21st century? I hope so. At the start of this brief history of mathematics, I set out my stall. Mathematics, I said, is the queen of science. Of course, microscopes and telescopes and countless key experiments have played a hugely important role in the history of science. But I believe that the main driving force behind scientific discovery is mathematics. Of course, I'm a mathematician, and of course I'm biased in favour of my own discipline. But time and again in this brief history of mathematics, I hope I've shown just how powerful mathematics can be in the scientific quest to understand the world. Galileo said that the universe is written in a mathematical language. And until we understand that language, we have no hope of reading it. Without mathematical insight, scientists are wandering around in a dark labyrinth. Mathematics is the queen of science, but here's the final twist. It achieves this status not because it sets out to answer scientific questions, but because mathematicians pursue mathematics for its own sake. Mathematicians deal in abstract problems. Their equations have a life of their own, detached from reality. But it is the solutions to these abstract problems that have had amazing and often unintended consequences for the world of science. It is the mathematicians who focus solely on mathematics who have changed the course of modern science. Thanks for listening to this podcast from BBC Radio 4 with me, Marcus de Sotoy. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget you can collect the whole set, all ten episodes of A Brief History of Mathematics, as well as the terms and conditions, can be found at bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts.